Join us for Legally Adulting. Adulting is not supposed to be easy. What are the questions and concerns that we as young people have about living through a pandemic? Thank you so much for joining us today for our Wise Law Legally Adulting Seminar. My name is Simran Bakshi. I am an associate lawyer at Wise Law, and I am here today with my colleague, Paul Adam, who is also an associate at our firm. Hello, Simran. Hello, everyone. We really want to tailor this program to what you are most interested in hearing about. So we will be opening up the floor at the end of our presentation uh, for a question and answer session. If you've got any questions along the way, feel free to jot it down. Uh, use the chat function. You can use it throughout the program. And Paul and I are going to do our best to get through them. Simran, you and I are part of this under 40 millennial generation. And I think the two signature experiences of being part of that generation is trying to find a feeling of having both your feet on solid ground amidst the constantly growing and shifting personal and professional responsibilities that we have. Being an adult is the elusive goal of having both of your feet on the ground then, and the never-ending process of trying to get there is adulting. Um, we started legally adulting really for two reasons. Uh, to connect with other professionals like ourselves and find out what kind of legal questions, uh, worries, and challenges everyone is facing as they go on their own adulting journey. And second of all, um, uh, to make the case for how maybe building a relationship with a lawyer and a law firm uh, can help you stay confident, stay on course, um, and externalize some of those worries in your own personal never-ending quest to get both of your feet on solid ground. From an employment law perspective, I think we can all agree we've faced a great deal of uncertainty and interruption with our jobs and our businesses. Um, within a matter of days, we've gone from working our jobs, business as usual, to suddenly being confined to our homes with our spouses, our dogs, our cats, our babies, all making friendly appearances. Um, and we're all scrambling to figure out, you know, how do we make this new reality work for us? For some of us, it's meant learning how to work remotely. Um, for others, it's been being very courageous and, and working as essential workers in the face of COVID. Um, some of us have faced temporary layoffs, and unfortunately, some of us have even faced the termination of our employment. Um, business owners haven't had it any easier. Uh, they've had to make some really difficult decisions about just to stay financially afloat. And of course, a lot of those decisions have to do with the workforce. So each circumstance is different. It's going to lead to different questions and concerns. And our goal today is to give you a basic understanding of how that employment law framework in, in Ontario works as it stands. Uh, keep in mind, the COVID-19 situation is evolving, and with it, laws and regulations are also subject to change. So we will be in the hands of our government and health officials to get some directions in terms of the weeks ahead. So let's start with some basic terminology. There's been a lot of discussions about layoffs and terminations, and this language has even been used interchangeably. But it's important that you know that that's not referring to the same thing. A layoff, by its very virtue, is intended to be temporary in nature. It requires that the employee be recalled to work and generally within a prescribed time frame. Before COVID-19 hit us, an employer could only lay off an employee if it was permitted to do so by contract. In other words, if you didn't have an employment contract that specifically included a layoff provision, your employer wasn't allowed to just suddenly lay you off from work unless they otherwise asked for your permission. Now, if your employer did nonetheless lay you off and they did that without any kind of contractual authority or your permission, that would turn into something we call a constructive dismissal, which essentially means you as the employee have grounds to actually resign and to treat that resignation as being a termination. Now, why is that important? Um, because there is a difference in terms of entitlement 
if you resign versus if you're terminated. If you resign on your own, um, you're typically required to give notice. So it's not the employer who needs to give you any notice. You're the one who says, you know, in two weeks, I'm not going to be working here anymore. But if you're terminated without any cause, your employer actually needs to give you notice of that termination by law. Um, and so it, that's what we commonly refer to as a severance package. So if you resign, you may not have entitlements to a severance package. If you are terminated or if you're forced to resign, what we call a constructive dismissal, you may have those entitlements. So going back to the concept of a layoff, if your employer laid you off without the proper grounds to do so, you could treat that as being a dismissal and ask for a severance package. As you can imagine, you know, in the normal world, that framework worked fine, but it started to create some problems when the pandemic started. Many employers were not allowed to operate, and so by virtue, their employees couldn't be working. But many of them didn't really have layoff provisions in their contracts that would allow them to temporarily sever or suspend that working relationship. So by a strict reading of the law, what this basically did was resulted in a lot of unintended terminations. Now, the government recognizing this gap has recently passed a regulation to address this matter. This regulation basically provides that if an employee's hours have been reduced or eliminated because of the pandemic, this is going to be deemed as being an infectious disease uh, emergency leave, um, which is basically an unpaid but job protected leave. So the government essentially said, we're not going to treat this as whether it's a layoff and if it's been done technically, all of that is out of the window. It's now going to be treated as if it's an emergency leave. Um, so by the same reasoning, any question of whether this is a constructive dismissal and if you've got severance entitlements is kind of put on pause as well. And this regulation um, applies effective retroactively from March 1st until at least six weeks from the day that the emergency order made by the government is lifted. Now keep in mind that this only applies to statutory layoffs, meaning the way layoffs are defined in our Employment Standards Act. And there are circumstances where our courts may be called upon to consider, you know, can an employee maybe treat their employment as having been improperly laid off going beyond that statute? And that's a whole other complex topic that um, we can get into in a little bit more detail if you've got any specific questions about it. But just to, in short, it's not very clear how the courts are going to deal with the concept of a layoff and if it's been an unlawful layoff. Um, but I suspect the, the terms of that regulation are going to really define what the courts do as well. So that's kind of the difference between a layoff and a termination and how it's now in effect with the pandemic. Um, I know a lot of you also have quite a few questions about, you know, we're now at a stage where many of us are returning to work. How is that going to look like? Um, what if you've got concerned about the safety of your workplace? Or what if you want to continue working remotely? Um, there are childcare responsibilities and family status related concerns. So it, the list can go on and on and on. And I definitely do want to address that in further detail. I'll leave that to our question and answer session, but let us know if you've got any questions about that as well. Thanks for that employment update, Simran. I know just talking to my friends and colleagues, it seems like it's an area where people are really going through it right now. I know it's been really challenging, but on, you know, the silver lining is it's also given us a lot of time to start thinking about our wills and estates. And I know you can walk us through that. Uh, the estate court system is totally in, again, in a state of upheaval. And a lot of lawyers and a lot of judges are figuring out on the fly um, the new rules about what kind of evidence they will accept um, as to whether a will was made in a valid way when it comes to the process of um, a judge uh, affirming that last will is valid and the person that it names as the executor of the deceased's estate is uh, ready to manage the estate. Uh, that's a process that we call uh, probate. And having a lawyer who, you know, for however long this pandemic goes on, can uh, sort of envision the process of how we're going to make a will, how we are going to gather evidence that we can later present in court as to why that will should be accepted as valid, um, to how we're going to set up the process of administering um, an estate through the pandemic when courts are, you know, maybe only taking some uh, uh, 
maybe only taking some uh, court filings on an urgent emergency basis, having a lawyer who understands and who has gone through that process from start to finish is really an ally in your corner. Um, simplify to save yourself time, uh, to save yourself the mental energy of trying to figure out this evolving process by yourself. And I know you and I have had quite a few discussions about what's going to stick going forward. And it seems to me that with technology, with, with these meetings now being recorded over Zoom, it's so much more descriptive uh, as to the question of capacity. It's someone is signing something freely with the understanding of what they're signing. Are you hearing any kind of buzz from the courts in terms of what may stick and what may not stick? You know, there are already some jurisdictions in the United States where you're just allowed at any time to make a last will um, that is uh, seen and witnessed um, with the use of an electronic signature. That's you know, something that is somehow um, not forgeable. A lot of the electronic signatures are backed up by some kind of um, a unique uh, blockchain uh, code, um, which I do not pretend to understand in the slightest. Um, but I think, you know, what we, a legal thing that lawyers have told ourselves for a long time that um, meeting an office in a fancy boardroom with many books lining the walls um, with a lawyer um, is a rock solid, um, uh, rock solid gold standard um, guarantee that whatever was signed in the lawyer's office is valid. Um, and I think that is uh, a fiction that pretty soon we're all going to have to disabuse ourselves of because Lord knows there have been enough famous estate litigation cases in Ontario that have challenged that notion. And I think we are going to see the courts are going to rethink, you know, what counts as good evidence that a will is valid. Is it being in the same room as the witness or is it really having a comprehensive and logical and sort of thought out from first principles process of getting to know your client um, and preserving evidence of what your client was thinking and what your client um, was worried about and how your client was um, acting um, during the waking process. Um, I, I think that we're going to go back to first principles of um, what, uh, you know, what is a good piece of evidence that a will was valid? And uh, I think a, a lot of sacred cows are going to get taken down off the mantelpiece. Now, it's really interesting. Because I, I think the next couple of months is going to really define just pro progress in the legal system from filing documents to how wills uh, are being executed. So it'll be really interesting to see that. But Paul and I have only really just gotten to the, ice, the tip of the iceberg with your questions. I know you've got many more questions for us. Um, before we get to our question and answer session, we did just want to briefly get to, so you've got a question, what are the logistics of actually reaching out to a lawyer and getting an answer to that question? Um, most law firms, including our office, do offer consultation calls. These, are, these calls are typically complimentary, um, but that's certainly something you should confirm um, when you do call the firm. Um, in our office, it's scheduled with a lawyer, and it's typically from 15 to 30 minutes. Um, the purpose of this call is really to understand what your question is about, and are we in a position where we can help you? So be prepared to give us some background information to help us understand what your question is really about. Um, oftentimes, we'll even ask that you provide us with some documentation before the call so we really have a, a good understanding of, of what we're talking about here. Um, from an employment law perspective, it's very helpful to have a copy of your employment contract, as an example, um, just because that will tell us, you know, what were the terms that you originally agreed to when you started that relationship? Is it enforceable? Can, is there room to challenge it? Um, so we'll, we can often guide you in terms of what would be helpful for us to review before our call, but just be prepared to have your documents ready, your notes ready, because it can really be helpful. Um, the purpose of these calls, like I said, is really to understand your question, but also to understand if we can help you. Um, not every question is going to be a legal question. As much as we might all start off thinking that it is, 
sometimes when you get into discussions, you come to realize that either it's a little premature to go down the legal road, or maybe it's not really a legal objective that you have. Maybe you're looking for acknowledgement that someone's done wrong, um, or you want that contractor to actually fix something that they've done. You don't really want to go to court over it. So it's, it's a good way to really get to the bottom of what you're looking for. Um, and sometimes we'll tell you, you know, we can't help you because you're not looking for a legal solution, but here's some things you might want to think about. So that, that's what you can expect from, from a consultation. Um, it's not, we can't really get into specifics during this call because we would need to get into completing a comprehensive review of your matter, but we can certainly give you enough information so you can weigh what your options are. Um, like I said, this call is really intended to also help you assess whether the lawyer and the law firm is the right fit for you. You want to make sure you're comfortable talking to the lawyer, that you feel like you're being heard, you feel like you're, the lawyer really understands what your objectives are, because as much as it's our job to really advocate for you and to really present your story, at the end of the day, it is your story. We want to make sure that you remain in the driver's seat with regards to your lawsuit. So you want to make sure you feel like you're actually being heard. Um, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions to your lawyer about what their approach may be, what the next steps ahead may be, what the terms of the retainer would look like. These are all very good questions and you should absolutely ask them during your consultation. Um, and like I said, keep in mind that our job is really to look at your facts and see if we can fit that into the lens of the legal system. From a legal, how do we look at this from a legal perspective? Um, I know Paul's going to get into some tips and tricks about what, what to think about when you're going through that consultation process. So I'm going to hand over the reins to him. To pick up on something that you said, Simran, you're looking for the right fit in a lawyer. And that means that you're interviewing uh, the lawyer for the job of representing you uh, in court. Um, you're not the interviewed for the position of client of Wise Law Office. And why I think that's such an important framework for to bring into these meetings is that what we really rely on from our clients um, in the consultation process is honesty. Be honest about what happened and be honest about and what you did and didn't do, and let us find a way to um, to take the facts and while presenting the facts in an honest way, in a uh, in a factually accurate way, to nevertheless um, highlight the things that uh, put you in a good light. We're here to fight for you, and we can do that regardless of whether our clients had some slip ups along the way or not. We had more time, we could go on and on and on about all of these topics, but our objective today is to really tailor this discussion to address your questions. Um, whether it's just, you know, how do I deal with a lawyer? How do I get a lawyer? Or a specific topic relating to something you're going through. We'd definitely love to hear from you. And on that note, we're gonna open up the floor for questions and answers. Hello, everybody. Gary Wise here. I see Paul and Simran are here. Um, we pre-recorded that session just to avoid the um, potential problems of internet and other related technical troubles. So hope that was great. Um, we've got quite a few questions from you already. Um, feel free to turn your audio and cameras on if you wish. If you'd prefer um, not to, that's great too. Um, and I'm going to ask Paul and Simran maybe to begin with the first question. Sure. Okay, well, great. Hello again, everybody. Um, Hi, so we did get a whole list of questions from all of you. Thank you for that. And one of the most popular questions we've gotten to date is, when should you make a will? And Paul has a lot to say about that. Sure do. Uh, thanks again to everybody who was able to make it out today. And thanks to everybody who asked so many great questions. Um, in order to understand uh, when should you make a will, I mean, first of all, the short answer is that there's no right or wrong time to make a will at all. But the things that I like to tell people are when they ask me this 
are, uh, um, there's four really important considerations that go into making a will. Um, and any time that your fundamental answer to any of those four big questions has changed, it's maybe time to start thinking about making a new will or uh, replacing uh, a will that you had before. So just to run down those four questions real quick, I would say the first one is, who's the person that you want to manage your estate, uh, all of your property and all of your affairs after you've died? Uh, who are the people or who is the person that you want to inherit everything from you uh, after you pass away? Three, what does your property consist of? Is it bank accounts? Is it a house or houses? Is it a business or businesses? Is it uh, the right to uh, to some piece of intellectual property? Is it a, a right to some interest in a family trust? And four, uh, who are the people that you are providing money and care to in your lifetime? For most people, that includes minor children, if it includes any, but it can also include an older relative like a parent uh, or a relative or a friend or a person you know who has a disability. Anytime you need to update oh. how to prioritize all of those things in the last will you're making. Whoop, can everybody still hear me? We can now. Oh, great. Uh, Anytime it, anytime your fundamental answer to one of those questions has changed, for example, the person that you named to be the, the person who will manage your estate, your executor is a spouse to whom you are no longer married and therefore no longer trust to manage your financial affairs, that is probably a good time to consider making a will uh, to get... Oh, we seem to have a glitches. I think Paul will be back in a couple seconds. Let's try. Yeah, maybe what I'll, I'll just add in, um, at the risk of being morbid, there's been quite a, an in, increased interest in wills um, in this COVID era. And I, I think it's probably good planning just to get your affairs in order. Um, obviously, anybody with an illness um, or a medical issue um, should be thinking about doing a will, but really I, I think of wills as being part of your financial hygiene plan, um, your legal hygiene plan, and it's a good idea to get those affairs in, in, in place. Um, it's very tempting to delay it and procrastinate. Um, I'm one of those shoemakers who had no shoes until only a few years ago. We never got around to doing it, but once it's done, you've got some security um, in knowing what's going to occur and whether you're younger and just starting out a family um, or whether you're older and, and in a different um, season of life, it's still a good time to consider doing it. You'll never regret having it done and um, it, it's not a difficult or expensive process in almost all circumstances. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to give thought to doing it. Sorry, Paul, why don't you carry on? Um. No, I, I, I got another question uh, that I'm going to hopefully get to later on in the, uh, in the chat that was specifically written from the perspective of somebody with a young child and another one specifically from the perspective of somebody who's under 30. And I'm going to talk, you know, being one of those things myself, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about, you know, what spurred me and, and my uh, partner to make a will when we did. And and, you know, some things that young folks, people who feel healthy today uh, can maybe put their mind to. Um, Simran, here's an interesting question uh, that I wanted to put to you that uh, we got before today. Uh, and again, I know that a lot of people have been asking very similar questions to this uh, to me that I, of course, always pass on to you. Um, what are the benefits of staying on uh, CERB, uh, CERB versus going back to work on less hours and with less pay? So it's a really good question, and it's one that has, of course, come up very frequently in the last couple of weeks. 
Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is you may not necessarily have that option because remember, the criteria to even be eligible for CERB requires that, um, firstly, you have no income coming in. Um, it has to be, you, ha you cannot have earned more than $1,000 in employment um, or self-employed income in the 14 days of the four-week period. So if you've received more income um, because of certain hours you've been working, you may not necessarily qualify. And secondly, if you are seen as quitting your job voluntarily, the government has been really clear that you're not going to be entitled to serve. And why that matters in the context of this question is, if your employer is asking you to come back and you're saying, no, I, I'm, I'm not ready to come back, and assuming you don't have any valid uh, COVID-19 related concerns that you're, you're basing that decision on, that could be taken as being a resignation, which could create some trouble in terms of actually getting CERB benefits. But in terms of actually assessing if you've got some flexibility with staying on CERB or going back to work with a flexible schedule of some sort, you're going to want to keep those two criteria in mind for sure. Well, what I would add to that, Simran, is if you have um, an offer from your employer um, to return to work at anything that will generate more than the $1,000 um, in revenue, um, you basically can't say no to your employer and maintain eligibility for CERB. Um, CERB is premised on people having lost income and not having a job to go to. Um, nobody knows how aggressively the enforcement um, uh, of CERB violations um, will be, but uh, I, I think the safest thing to do is assume that an employer who you say no to is probably going to terminate you unless you have a very specific understanding. Once the government um, receives notice by way of a record of employment um, that you're being terminated for abandonment of your position, um, or the employer may deem it as a voluntary resignation, they're going to start asking questions. And again, we don't know how flexible um, the CERB administrative offices are going to be, but safely assume you can't say no to your employer. Your entitlement to CERB is going to end unless you have good reasons for saying no to your employer. And, you know, those reasons can include everything from unsafe conditions in the workplace um, that you've actually um, complained and, and, and commenced an occupational health um, and safety investigation on. Um, you may have caregiving obligations that you prevent, prevent you from working, um, whether those are to parents or grandparents or kids. And I know that one of the people who asked questions specifically mentioned grandparents. Um, if you've got legitimate care obligations, then that may be a legitimate reason um, to say no to your employer. But if you're in one of those zones, it's a good time to get legal advice. And, uh, you know, just uh, as we, we noted in the program earlier, pick up the phone, call us or call any other qualified employment law lawyers. And in five or 10 minutes, you'll, you'll have a much better idea of where you stand, what you can do and what you can't do. So I would urge that. Simran, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I was just going to mention, we did get two specific questions about special circumstances where you may not be comfortable returning to work. And we will get to those questions in a little bit more detail as well. But it, the, the short answer is it really depends on why you're not going back. If it's just because you want to continue to remain on CERB, that may not in itself be enough of a reason. Um, but if you've got some valid concerns about going back to work, like Gary alluded to, you, your best bet is to first get in touch with a lawyer. Let's talk it through, see if there's a different way to go about it and, and take it from there. But on, I know we also briefly going back to our, our wills and estates question. I know Paul mentioned this as well. We did have a follow-up question about timings of a will, and that is how important is it to have a will if you are in your 30s and you don't have many assets? And along the same lines, if, if, you, if you and uh, your spouse have a two-month-old baby, um, is it, do you need a comprehensive will at this time, or is that something that's going to change over time that maybe you should wait a little bit for? So my answer, the reason I, I wanted to tackle these two questions together, you know, first of all, 
they they speak to me directly because I have a two month old baby, and uh, I am in my thirties and I don't have uh, a huge number of assets. And uh, my wife and I got our last wills done about uh, two years ago. Uh, myself having been called to the bar four years ago, so um, you know, do as I do as I say, not as I do. But the 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 thing that I think that I think you need to remember about preparing a last will is that a, a last will even one that is made early in your lifetime for many people will contain the basic structure of how you would want your assets to be dispensed with for many, many, many years to come. Um, most people throughout their lifetime, you know, maintain a desire to uh, leave all of their assets to their spouse if their spouse or partner survives them. And if he or she doesn't, they want to leave it divided equally uh, between their children or if they're not planning on having children between another group of family members like nephews, nieces, uh, brothers or sisters. Um, and, you know, to the extent that that your basic line of thinking about that changes over time, it's fairly easy to get your will updated. But, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to get a will done even when you're young, even when you don't have a lot of assets, for the same reason that people go through the process of, you know, pre-qualifying for a mortgage, uh, or even doing something like checking out what schools are in the area uh, when they're thinking about buying a new house. It helps you focus your mind on questions that you're going to be dealing with down the line. And especially when it comes to the, the mortgage pre-qualification thing, one of the things that you do when, you're make, when you make a last will, regardless of what phase of your life you do it in is you make a relationship with a lawyer uh, you after you've made a last will with us uh, you may wind up adding one of us on LinkedIn um, and then when we see that there's been a big update in your life like you've been made a partner or we see that you've left your job and you've gone and started your own corporation or you know we happen to see on Facebook that you're you welcomed a new child into your life you know, because you have that relationship with your lawyer, um, or if I haven't seen any of those things, you just pick up the phone and call me. And then your lawyer already has a bit of background about what your state of affairs was prior to that. And it could be that down the line, making a subsequent will, making a more complex last will uh, later in life to deal with all of the new and exciting things that you've gotten into becomes an easier process because you took the first baby steps uh, when you didn't have a lot on your plate uh, to start with. So um, that's my pitch for making a will while you're young. Um, it, it echoes something that, that Gary said earlier. Uh, making a last will is not just about having the legal document. It's also a step towards relationship building with somebody who can help you with a lot of different areas of your life at a lot of different times in your life. Well, it's interesting. And we did have a follow-up question. I see Gary's already gotten to it, but it was, can you have more than one executor or and maybe should you have more than one executor? Uh, can you? Definitely. Um, should you? Uh, great question. And it depends on the situation. Uh, what a lot of people choose to do is have one executor that they name as their primary and another person that they name as an executor in the event that the primary executor uh, can't act. And, you know, for some people, there are situations in which they name one executor to deal with uh, a particular uh, group of assets, and then they name another executor to deal with another particular group of assets. One area in which you see that come up a lot is when a person has a lot of ordinary responsibilities, but then on top of that, if they're, let's say, a writer or a musician, they have a whole estate built around their rights to certain creative licenses, and they appoint a separate executor specifically to handle those things. So it happens sometimes, um, and most people name um, an executor and then one or multiple fallbacks. You know, the exception to that, and it's a fairly regular exception, sometimes people 
believe sometimes rightly that by naming as an example, all of their children as co-executors, um, there will be no power imbalance. There'll be a greater degree of cooperation, um, a greater degree of trust among all the children. Um, it can be, you know, it, it, you, you can also nominate um, one person from your family and a professional um, who may be able to assist in more complex issues if they're anticipated. Um, and again, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend nominating three siblings who don't get along to act as joint executors, but in a situation where everybody does get along and there's a history of cooperation, there's something to be said for spreading the work because it's not easy to be an executor. There's quite a bit to do, um, but also avoiding the kinds of breakdowns in trust that come when one sibling um, basically has access to all the information, gets to make all the decisions, and the remaining family members, um, the children of, of the deceased typically, are, are standing back and not feeling like they're getting adequate information. And those are often circumstances that go legal and become problematic. So, you know, when you're thinking about who to appoint, I think these are all really important questions to consider and maybe it's best to go with one with other children being alternates if the first one is unable or unwilling to act but sometimes putting a team in charge might be the best way to avoid um, any kind of problems and it varies as paul said from situation to situation and the only thing i'll add to that is because it varies so much from situation to situation you know, one of the things that you get out of the consultation process with the lawyer is that, and I, I want to sort of answer the follow-up to the follow-up question with that, is that, you know, sometimes it makes sense to advise everybody ahead of time that they're all being appointed as executors jointly. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to only name one person as executor and not have to deal with the, uh, the grief of uh, having to tell everybody that during your lifetime, but every situation is unique. And if you work through the process with a lawyer, we can help you weigh the pros and the cons of uh, each possibility and help you come up with uh, the decision that is right for you. Because chances are there will be some pros and some cons uh, to both directions. And, you know, we can, when you speak with us, we can take a lot of different factors into account and help you see what what you're potentially gaining and losing by choosing one direction over another. There's another follow-up, um, and I think you, you alluded to this. The question is, do I have to tell them that I'm naming them both as executor? Um, I'm not sure how private wills have to be. Um, as a general rule, you should get the consent of anybody who you're choosing to name as an executor. Um, they may have questions about what it involves, both in terms of the, you know, the administration and the legal side of it, but also in terms of your assets um, and what, what they're going to need to know. Um, we generally recommend that your executors consent firstly, but that you prepare a package of materials after you complete your will for your executor, letting le executors, letting them know where the assets are, what the assets are. Um, wh wh what the assets exactly are. Um, there's a whole other area about um, online related executorship, dealing with accounts and Facebook and bank accounts and passwords. Um, so your, your digital legacy, these are all good things once you've completed a will to put together in a package to make your executors' lives easy. Um, there's nothing more frustrating um, for a named executor than having a person's whole life online and not being able to access it because they don't have passwords. And while Facebook and, and other social media um, organizations have got specific policies and protocols to deal with um, a profile of a person who has passed away, it's onerous and cumbersome and takes a long time. And, you know, people may be made to feel very uncomfortable about the Facebook profile of a deceased person still being active. 
um, family members may be confronted with birthdays and other posts and just it, it's not always pleasant. Other people want to leave the pages up as a digital legacy forever and that, that's also perfectly fine. But uh, generally speaking, get your executors to buy in and then do everything you can to make their jobs as easy as possible. Joshua, I hope that covered um, your question. Uh, Simran, uh, this is another question that we got prior to the event that I wanted to put to you. Um, uh, this, is, this is an interesting scenario. One of my friends is getting forced into work. The manager called and told him to either come into work starting next week or to send a notice that he quits. But he has grandparents at home for another three weeks and they have cancer and he doesn't want to expose them to anything. So my question is, is it illegal for the manage, manager to force him? I think it's pretty illegal to make them come back to work. The manager is either asking him to come back to work or give notice. I don't think he'll fire him. It's pretty illegal, no? Well, no, it's a great question. Unfortunately, a lot of people are actually being faced with similar circumstances, um, given just the context that we're in right now. Um, a starting point to that question, to answer that question, is under the Human Rights Code in Ontario, we, an employer does have a duty to accommodate your family status, um, and that would include spouses, children, grandparents, arguably as well. Um, so what that essentially means is if you require some form of accommodation, so for example, maybe it's working remotely, or maybe it's continuing to stay on leave for three weeks. Um, your employer, as a starting point, generally has a duty to accommodate that, but keep in mind that that duty to accommodate goes up until a point of undue hardship. So it's going to really depend employer to employer whether something like that um, would amount to hardship. You know, given the time frame that we're talking about here and the fact that we're all dealing with the complications of COVID, it really doesn't seem like that would necessarily rise to the level of hardship that, that the tribunal would be looking for. But it will depend circumstance to circumstance, um, both based on what the employee is asking for and what the employer is able to do. Um, along the same lines, like when we're thinking about going, you know, whether to go back to work and you might have childcare responsibilities or, um, you know, you might have a, a spouse who's got a disability. So we each have unique circumstances that are going to come into play. But when you talk about accommodations for family status, it's one of the grounds in the code that are, it's a bit trickier than the others only because the tribunal will consider, you know, is it reasonable to go out there and make other arrangements? In this case, you know, again, given the time frame and given how serious the potential complications could be, um, I don't think the ask to continue to be on leave or to continue uh, to be able to work remotely is unreasonable. Um, but in other circumstances, you know, we, as an example, if you've got children who you are caring for at home who could potentially be going to daycare now that that's reopened that's a different set of circumstances so it's really going to depend case by case and the best thing you can do again is speak with a lawyer let's go through that assessment of whether what you're asking for is reasonable whether you've properly informed your employer of what it is you're asking for so in this case you know have, have you has your friend gone to the employer and said this is my situation can I be accommodated for three weeks? Because that would be the starting point is have a dialogue. So if you've got a question like this, reach out to a lawyer. Let's talk about what steps you can be taking and whether what you're asking for is reasonable and should be accommodated by your employer. The, we've also got some other um, wills and estates questions that have come up as well. This one's actually an interesting one because I know we've dedicated some time to wills, but we've got a question about what is the difference between a will and a power of attorney and do I need both? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, we've talked a lot about wills tonight, so I want to mostly, if I can, dwell on powers of attorney when I answer this. The, in short, a last will is something that regulates everything that will be done with your property after you pass away. And a power of attorney, on the other hand, is a document that regulates what will happen to you during your lifetime vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your property, all of the things that you own on the one hand, and your personal health care and your personal uh, health needs on the other hand. Um, any person who is capable of making a will um, is usually also capable of making a power of attorney. 
Um, and a power of attorney for property is something that you can give to anybody to handle your property in the exact same way that you would. Um, and it can either be only effective when you're no longer able to manage your property, or it can be effective uh, concurrent to while you manage your property. An example of that would be, you know, let's say you have a very complex investment, you can name somebody as your attorney to manage that investment for you. And then that person can make some management decisions about that investment on your behalf while you would be theoretically capable of doing it yourself if you had the knowledge and the wherewithal. Um, and when it comes to healthcare, you can make a power of attorney for personal care that governs all of the decisions about, you know, the, the so-called basics, which is uh, when you will be given medical treatment and when you will not be given medical treatment, um, which typically comes into play in an end of life situation. But also if you face a situation in which you are alive and you are living some kind of a, uh, a life that has quality to it, but you're not able to make healthcare decisions for yourself if you have had a brain injury and you're not able to understand the nuances of some aspects of your personal care uh, for the foreseeable future. But nevertheless, there's every reason for you to live and for you to enjoy life uh, in the, the way that you can. Uh, you can delegate the ability to make those personal care decisions to somebody who can then make decisions about where you're going to live, what kind of clothes you're going to wear, uh, what kind of food you're going to eat. Um, and the power of attorney, uh, the power of attorney then makes somebody an attorney who takes care of those healthcare decisions for you. Um, these powers of attorney, uh, to the quest, to the point of, do I need both powers of attorney and a last will? Uh, my view is that in some ways it's more important to have a power of attorney than it is to have a last will. Um, although, let me be clear, I, I think both are very important, but the thing that's really critical about, of a, power, about a power of attorney is that if you don't make one that appoints somebody to be able to manage your property and manage your personal care uh, while you are capable of doing so, um, if you suddenly have a very serious injury or a very serious illness and you can no longer make the power of attorney yourself, um, for certain types of healthcare and certain types of property decisions, the only way for somebody to be able to make those decisions on your behalf is by applying to court um, and getting a hearing before a judge in which the judge will determine whether that person can act as your legal guardian. And the process of doing that is in a best case scenario uh, long and drawn out and expensive, and it not only wastes time in the face of some sometimes very critical um, healthcare and uh, property decisions that need to be made on an urgent basis, uh, but it also can really put a drain on money that may in that moment be really necessary in order to pay for uh, your medical bills or to pay for uh, a PSW who can come and take care of you in your home or can help uh, pay for your family's needs uh, when you're suddenly not able to work. Um, I, you know, maybe I can jump in because the, um, the guardianship approach to things is fraught with peril. Um, Paul and I worked on a matter last year um, where the wife of a man who was critically ill, but thankfully actually um, got much better and recovered, um, she needed to apply for guardianship to make medical and financial decisions regarding this, her, her husband and his business. Um, and a child from a prior marriage opposed it. And as a result, it wasn't just going before a judge and rubber stamping a family application. It actually turned into something that could have been litigated um, 
to the point of a trial. We were able to resolve it, fortunately. But it just look it speaks to the question of should you have a power of attorney for property and care? Yes, you should. Um, it's critical. Um, the if, if you're in a hospital and unable um, to tell your doctors what you want and what you don't want, um, they're going to do essentially what they want unless there's somebody with a power of attorney. Um, and if they can't figure it out, then they've got to go through their own consent and capacity process. So you don't want to be in that position when, you know, you, you've been in an unfortunate but serious accident and you simply can't um, tell the doctors what you do, what you want to do. And so a trusted person to act in that role um, is really in your best interest. And to reiterate what I said earlier, it's, it's part of your legal hygiene package. Once it's there, it can stay in place as long as you want it to. Um, most people will appoint a spouse um, or an adult child, um, and that never needs to be disturbed until you want to. But if you don't do that planning um, and something terrible and unforeseen happens, um, it's going to be very messy and potentially quite expensive. Just on the expense point, to give a, a very concrete example of what the expenses are like, um, you know, for most lawyers, in, including our own law firm, um, the fees to make a power of attorney start at somewhere around the range of three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, the cost of filing an application with the court, never mind paying your lawyer, even if you're doing the application yourself, just the cost to file the application uh, in court to have somebody appointed as your guardian is around is over $200 now um, in the current scale of court fees in Ontario. Um, so the mere act of trying to apply to have somebody appointed as a guardian before you're even contemplating paying your lawyer will um, wipe out uh, or uh, cancel out the, the fees that you would otherwise be paying to a lawyer to um, have the, the planning done ahead of time. Um, and just uh, while we're on the topic, um, one of my pitches as to why you should have um, a lawyer make the power of attorney, um, I know it is a document that seems really simple um, and really straightforward, but with powers of attorney, uh, like, like last wills, the question of whether you were capable of making the power of attorney at the time you made it um, is so, so, so crucial, especially um, if you are making it um, in or around the time that you've been diagnosed with some sort of condition or you've had some sort of an accident or a physical trauma, um, doing going through the process with a lawyer is not a it's not an ironclad guarantee that the document will be accepted as valid, but circumstantially, it's one of the the best things you can do to protect your assets and your loved ones from frivolous challenges to their authority uh, to act on your behalf in a crisis situation. So before, we've got a question that came in from Brenda, but before we get there, there was a, a question from Joshua, just to clarify, um, can you appoint someone else as a power of attorney? And I'm wondering if he's, if he's asking if it has to be the same as an executor. Um, Joshua, I'm not sure if that's specifically your question, but. It can be, it can be different people. And yeah. It often is. It can also be the same person. Um, and again, it often is, um, but it's, you know, totally depends on the context. Sometimes the person who will be making uh, crisis decisions for you in a healthcare scare is totally different than the person who will be dealing uh, with your property on a very long time scale after your death. Yeah, just, just as an example, um, you may want to um, appoint your brother in Aurelia um, to be the executor of your will, um, but you probably want to appoint somebody who's more local as your power of attorney for care, just so that person can get to the hospital in a timely fashion if required. So just there, again, these are all 
good questions, things that people do think about and need to think about when they're creating these documents. And many of these kinds of questions can be resolved in a quick discussion with your lawyers when you're actually um, in the midst of, of dealing with the documents. Simran, let me throw it back to you here. Um, somebody wrote to us, I was let go from my job with no explanation as to why. A week later, I found out that they hired someone else to replace me. Should I sign their quote unquote enhanced severance package? So great question again. Um, before I get there, though, I did promise Brenda an answer in more detail to her question about constructive dismissals. Uh, specifically, she was asking if a person can claim a constructive dismissal after resigning. And the short answer is yes. Uh, typically, when you say constructive dismissal, you're basically saying, I have been compelled to resign because you've just flipped the script on me. This is not the job that I agreed to do. Um, so generally speaking, it does involve having resigned from your job. But I will say there is one caveat to that. If you're feeling as if you're getting to the point where you're getting very frustrated with how your employment has changed, it's a good time to reach out to a lawyer only because it's a constructive dismissal is very tricky. You want to make sure you've got the proper um, steps taken prior to actually alleging a constructive dismissal. Um, primarily, you want to make sure you've got a history of saying, you're changing the terms of my employment. I'm not okay with the fact that you're doing this. Please let me go back to doing my old job. I want to go back and do my old job. I'm willing to do that. So it's really good to have that kind of strong documentary record before you go ahead and allege a constructive dismissal. Simran, um, why, don't you, why don't you speak a bit to the kinds of changes um, an employer can try to impose mm -hmm. that would result um, in a potential constructive dismissal? So one of the... the most the, the most common examples is basically demoting an employee in terms of title or in terms of responsibilities. Unfortunately, we often see, especially in the context of a restructuring, suddenly you go into work and that portfolio of, of work you had always been responsible for for 20 years is now being given to somebody else. Um, or your title has slightly changed, but with it, within your industry, it's no longer considered to be as reputable as it, as it was. So a demotion of that kind of nature can, can be an example of a constructive dismissal. Uh, by the same token, if your employer reduces your salary significantly, and I say significantly, generally it's at least about 10% or so, um, that can be grounds for a constructive dismissal because that's not um, the salary that you've agreed upon. Um, same thing with hours of work. If suddenly, you know, you, you've gone from being a full-time employee for the last three years and now you're asked to basically take on part-time hours, that can be a pretty significant change, not only in terms of the work you're doing, but also the compensation that you get from that. What's a little bit trickier is when there's changes in location. Um, sometimes, you know, you might have been working from your Toronto office and now you're asked to work from Brampton. Um, and you know, yes, it's a bit far and it's inconvenient, but your employer does have some discretion to change the day-to-day -day terms of your employment. So whether that's going to amount to such a fundamental change that it's, it's a constructive dismissal, that wouldn't be as clear cut, um, so to say. Yeah, I mean, other examples that pop into my mind, salary reductions in excess of 15% um, are problematic. We did a case um, a couple of years ago for a senior executive whose company merged um, with an, her, whose huge company merged with another huge company. And she was left in limbo um, for months about what her job was going to be. Um, she wasn't told whether she was keeping her job, whether they were going to reassign her or whether they were just going to downsize her. Um, because when huge companies merge, there's two of everything and the company doesn't always need two of everything. So in that case, um, after again, very carefully um, documenting her concerns um, with legal advice so that it was all in writing, um, the, uh, the decision was made um, because she got another offer um, to resign because she didn't know whether the offer she had received was ultimately going to be better than what they, better or worse than what they had in mind for her because they didn't even know. And we did a successful trial for her. The, the thing to remember is that 
um, hearkening back to Simran's earlier comments about documentation, the reason we won is the judge preferred our client's evidence because she had documented everything. Um, not only did she remember things, she could pull out emails that she had written in conjunction with us, setting out exactly what her concerns were, whereas the manager um, who was appearing on behalf of the employer um, had vague memories sort of about what he kind of thought had happened. And at the end of the day, it was that documentation that won the case for her. So just to, to underline when you're thinking of alleging constructive dismissal, this is probably the most important time of all that you should get legal advice. Um, a related time to get legal advice, um, some, some bef sometime before this emerges, is when you've got an employment agreement that you're being asked to sign. Sometimes employment agreements include provisions that allow employers to make huge fundamental changes and depending on the position that you're taking, you may want to negotiate that point um, among others. So we, we haven't spoken about employment agreements yet tonight, but you know, I, if, if I were to be asked the two most, the, the three most important times to speak to an employment lawyer, it's number one, when you're given an, an employment agreement, number two, when you're concerned that your job is gonna change and you may be constructively dismissed, and finally, um, if you actually have been terminated and you've received papers, don't sign anything. Talk to a lawyer before you sign. If you sign the documents that the employer presents to you, um, then you may regret it a week or two later. Um, you probably won't be able to undo what you've done once you've signed that documentation. We actually have a follow-up question to this topic, and it is from Jeff. What if the business has had to change or pivot in response to market demand and needs its employees to modify their duties? Whether, and I assume you're asking whether that's gonna to amount to a constructive dismissal. I'm gonna use my favorite answer, it depends. It depends on, like Gary mentioned, what's in your employment contract. Do you have a term that says you can make um, certain changes? Now keep in mind, when we talk about these kinds of changes that give root to a constructive dismissal claim, it needs to be fundamental. The fact that you are now asking the employee to work um, from one desktop to a laptop, as an example, if it's, if it's very minor and if it's not really changing the essence of the job itself, that most likely is not going to form a constructive dismissal. So when you talk about modifying duties, it depends on how you're modifying those duties. Are you basically, you know, completely removing this person from um, reception and they're no longer having any contact with patients? Or are they simply no longer doing one task in, their, in the 10 steps that they do every day? So it, it will really depend on the context. Yeah, the, um, the current regulation to the Employment Standards Act gives employers virtually unlimited flexibility around hours. Um, so if you need to shorten a workday or go to three days a week, um, then that is safe um, until six weeks after the government emergency um, declaration is ended. Um, I don't think modifying duties, particularly if a demotion is involved, is necessarily that protected. And you should get legal advice before any, any changes of that nature. Um, but for employers and employees, there, there will ultimately be a day of reckoning in whenever the post-COVID era comes. Um, businesses that have to shrink are at some point going to permanently terminate employees. And at that point, their notice entitlements um, are going to, the employees' notice entitlements are going to crystallize. Employers are going to have to pay reasonable notice um, subject to what, what's in their employment agreements. And there will be such a reckoning. Just right now, we're still in a semi-suspended economy in the province of Ontario. That's not going to last forever. Hopefully, um, we'll be back to something that's slightly more normal um, soon. You know, the, the other topic in terms of changes and constructive dismissal 
and I know somebody's going to raise this argument at some point, um, is whether requiring employees to work from home um, can be something that would give rise to a constructive dismissal. So for all those businesses that are now flirting with the idea of closing their offices permanently and not ever returning to normal, um, this may have some complications. We're, we're already hearing about employees who are being put to extra expense to work at home, um, who are having all kinds of trouble working at home because of the presence of kids. Um, while some employees love it, um, there are some people for whom it's a problem. And where, where all of that will land is a really interesting question. And we'll see, we'll see what happens in the months ahead because there will be these kinds of changes for many businesses and employees will have rights. Again, they'll be addressed by the courts in the context of what the new workplace is going to look like. And none of us can tell you what's really going to happen because the situation is still so fluid and fluctuating, but there will be litigation. There will be wrongful dismissal and constructive dismissal cases around the question of working from home. And along the same line, if I can just, yep, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Sorry, I, I just wanted to throw something in here, not so much as an employment lawyer, but as a millennial. Um, I can, I, I have to say that I think a lot of people our age who are joining this discussion today have been through the experience where somebody has told them that they have to put up with some sort of totally unreasonable um, employment situation and be told and be told or have it very strongly insinuated that they should be extremely grateful that they're being offered anything at all. Are you talking and about during the COVID period or just generally? I'm even before the COVID pandemic, but I think it counts double uh, since the pandemic has started. Um, and one of the things that we offer people in general, but I think especially in the employment context, is we reframe um, your experience with your employment, not around how lucky you are to have a job, but how many rights you have uh, to, um, to have a job that meets certain uh, legal standards of what is uh, proper uh, and bare minimum employment in the province of Ontario. I, do, I remember being one of those people when I got my first job and I remember I was at a bank and they handed me, you know, a stack of papers this high to sign and I did not even look at it. I was surprised somebody wanted to pay me any money, signed it right off the bat and thankfully didn't have any issues. But if I knew what I know now, I would definitely not be doing that. So it's a really valid point. But we've actually got a really interesting question that came in. It's actually a very loaded question for you, Paul. And mm -hmm. that is... The best there, kind. <laughs> there has been ongoing dispute with our neighbor. Our neighbor is being charged for criminal mischief and harassment. He has installed cameras around his property since then. And one day, a worker we hired and a good friend of ours um, was putting up a fence around our property. The neighbor's camera recorded their conversation and allegedly said that they were talking about attempting to sexually assault a female family member. My neighbors posted the video um, on several community Facebook pages. The person who uttered those words is not our regular employee, and we have no knowledge of this and have no control of the situation. There has been some backlash on our business, and some of our customers have informed us that there are letters circulating to stop doing business with us. We can't prove that this is our neighbor who is circulating these emails. My question is, can we put a stop on this individual from posting on Facebook and social media? Is this enough proof to file a defamation lawsuit? Um, so there are so many interesting, fascinating angles to this problem. Um, and whoever posted it, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to us directly after this program is over and let's have a talk about it because there are so many legal issues here to unpack, um, almost all of which we uh, can help you with. Um, the sort of the general question here is what can I do? I, 
with our assistance, I, I think to most of these things, there is a response uh, in the law that you can take that we can help you coordinate. But I just want to break down some of the things that the, the that the uh, the person asking this question has put on the table. Um, disputes with neighbors are some of the oldest stories in the recorded history of law going back to you know medieval and um, early modern England and um, uh, recording people on security cameras and posting it on of the most up-to-date uh, uh, bleeding edge concerns that um, are being tackled by the law. And it's interesting how things change and how things don't change. But what I can say is that in the last 10 years or so, the government of Ontario has recognized that um, everybody has a right to be free, uh, protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of Canada, uh, to be free of uh, certain uh, kinds of intrusions into their privacy, um, which in some ways doubles double as forms of harassment. Um, and in the very, very broadest terms, uh, some of those uh, privacy rights that everybody have include um, the right not to have somebody um, intrude on what you consider to be a private domain or a private space. Um, so if you own a home and you have a, a semi-private uh, area around that home, you know, you may have a right not to be filmed in that area. Um, and if somebody is, has installed a camera with the aim to uh, film you there and, you know, expose things that are going on there that you have the right to try to protect from public scrutiny, uh, that can be against the law. Um, you also have the right um, to not have um, embarrassing personal information about yourself um, disclosed in a public manner. Um, and that means that if somebody gets wind of something, you know, either deliberately or, or accidentally to you, it was posted publicly. And in your case, the, the case of the person asking this question, it may include something like the fact that you had a very close personal relationship with somebody who was alleged to have committed um, sexual harassment. Um, or, you know, somebody who, or the fact that somebody has been um, the subject of an allegation of sexual harassment. Um, you may have the right that is enforceable in a court of law to prevent somebody else from taking that information and disseminating it in public, including on a Facebook page. Um, you may also have the right to um, have, uh, to prevent somebody from you know, publishing things that are not necessarily false about you, but if published out of context, um, will sort of portray you in a false light. And an example has been brought up in this situation. If the neighbor is posting something about a conversation that was overheard on your property, and by doing that, the neighbor is insinuating that this person is an employee of yours or a relative of yours or somehow intimately connected with you, um, that may portray you in a false light, and that is something that you may have the right to be free from. Um, on top of all of this, um, you know, nobody in Canada is allowed to do things that intentionally inflict emotional harm on another person. There is actual, there's an unlawful act, which is called um, intentional infliction of emotional distress, um, and you know, the person who um, who asked this question mentioned that the person has been charged with criminal mischief and harassment. Um, all of these things can very often get rolled together, you know, creating a nuisance, um, uh, breaching into somebody's privacy, um, and um, writing things on a social media website that are untrue and therefore you know, defamatory about you. Um, and it is very difficult sometimes to prove that uh, somebody was behind these things, but it's not always impossible. And to the 
ultimate question at the end of that paragraph, is this enough proof to file a defamation lawsuit? Um, you don't always have to have, and this is where a lawyer can come in and assist you, you don't always have to have all of your ducks lined up in a row uh, in order to commence a lawsuit against somebody. Um, you, we can help you parse the information that you do have. And by speaking to a lawyer, we can sometimes help you to realize that, you know, you may know more than you think you know, and you may have more evidence than you think you have. Um, and if you have a very strong suspicion and there is some very strong but not definitive evidence that it was your neighbor who did this, um, sometimes in some situations it is possible and appropriate uh, to start a claim in court and we can assist with that. And after you have started the claim, you, you may be able to compel the other side um, uh, to disclose information to you that helps you prove your case. And if, the, if you don't know who it was that did that, sometimes by starting the claim in court, um, you can actually compel third parties to disclose information to you. Um, Facebook may keep a record or Google may keep a record of who sent these emails. Um, and, you know, by initiating a court action, you may be able to um, gather more information as the process is ongoing um, while having already taken steps to protect your rights um, and protect your ability to prove in a court of law that these, um, that these things that were said about you or your business aren't true and ultimately work towards the goal of getting compensation for any losses you may have suffered. Well, um, I, I, may I um, jump in? I, I'm, I, I agree with everything you said, Paul. I, I also would like to approach it from a slightly different perspective, um, damage control. Um, if, if I'm understanding the question completely, there are three different players here who all need to be addressed. The neighbor is the first um, character in this drama. There's, there are criminal proceedings ongoing. Um, it may be appropriate to consider civil proceedings, both in terms of damages, but also um, to prevent any further interference with privacy. Um, there's the person who's been called the quote employee. And if this person is just there building a fence um, and not really an, an ongoing employee of, of the business, that's one thing. If there's a, a more distinct relationship, um, employer employee relationship, um, it may have a greater reflection on your business. And in this era of cancel culture, um, I think you need to look very carefully at how you address this employee's future with you. Um, and finally, there's you, um, the questioner, and your business. And the, the, the question of how to deal with defamatory um, and injurious kinds of statements or videos is an increasingly common one. Sometimes the best thing to do um, is nothing and let it sort of die out um, over a couple of weeks, if it does, or a couple of months, um, given that almost anything you can do um, to address it may give rise to what is known as the Streisand effect, which means that by asserting your legal rights, you actually bring more damaging attention to yourself and everybody um, on Twitter and Facebook um, and social media generally is going to have an opinion about whether you did enough, whether you did too much, whether you're being fair, whether you're being unfair, um, whether um, this is really your fault um, or the employee's fault. And uh, my, my initial comment, damage control is priority number one. Um, and again, these are the kinds of discussions that, that you would have in a preliminary um, consultation just to go through um, the options that are available and to identify your objectives and those that are most doable um, to keep your business afloat and not suffering any further damage. So I echo Paul's comments. Um, if you're inclined, um, feel free to give us a call 
um, or send us an email um, at the office. Phone number is 416-972-1800. Um, you can speak to Joy by dialing zero and she'll put you in touch with one of us. Um, we'd be happy to help. This is a complex situation that I think you need some guidance on. One last thing I'll add into that um, is, you know, Gary and Simran, you mentioned in the employment law and the construct dismissal context, uh, the importance of documenting everything. Um, one other area in which it is extremely important to document anything are cases like this, where there are social media postings flying around. Um, sometimes a thing that is very, very damaging to you uh, can get abruptly deleted uh, for the person who made those comments to try to uh, cover his or her tracks. And, you know, while you're collecting information and contemplating what your next move is, try to get screen grabs of everything that you can. Um, if there are things that are hidden from you, try to get other people that you trust to get screen grabs as well. Um, sometimes when these things disappear, particularly now that we're into sort of web 3.0 and a lot of things happen in the context of Facebook stories, Snapchat, TikToks, things that like exist for a day and then dissolve, um, just sort of try to grab everything you can um, and preserve it um, just yeah. in case you need it down the line. If, if there are videos involved that you can't download, um, take your iPhone um, and record the video from your screen so you have a copy of it. Okay, why, why don't we move on to the next question? Yeah, uh, I have got another interesting one for Simran on an employment law issue. Um, somebody asks, um, uh, my immune system is compromised due to previous cancer treatment. My work refuses to let me work from home, even though that would be a workable setup. Is this protected under disability law? So we kind of touched upon this in our earlier discussions, but again, your employer does have a duty to accommodate um, for certain grounds under the Ontario Human Rights Code. And one of those grounds is disability. So if you need, um, if you've got certain medical needs, um, you should be reaching out to your employer to firstly inform them of what kind of accommodations you need. In the context of COVID-19, if you're someone who is immunocompromised um, and are at real risk if you're going back to the workplace, it's not. It, it seems like that would be a reasonable accommodation to be asking for so long as you can continue to be working remotely. Um, but like we've been saying throughout, it's all gonna depend on context. It's gonna depend on the size of your employer, um, the technology that's available, you know, have you been working remotely throughout this time? If you have, you know, it, it's not completely unreasonable to be asking for that to be extended until um, your doctor and you feel that it's safe for you to go back to work. The one tip that I would certainly give you is when it comes to accommodations, it's a two way street. You need to be, your employer needs to have enough information about what they, what you need in order to actually give it to you. So you don't necessarily have to give them, you know, specifics about your diagnosis or, or personal details like that, but you do need to give them enough information so they can understand what it is you're asking for and how they can accommodate you. Um, the employer has a duty to accommodate, but it doesn't necessarily have to be on the basis of your preferred accommodations. They just, they do have to accommodate you in a way that's going to make sense for your disability. So step one is start that dialogue. Um, it's certainly helpful to have, uh, and you should have supporting documentation from your doctors as well. Um, again, you don't need to get into detail. But a letter or a note from your doctor saying, I don't recommend so-and-so returns to work at this time, but she can continue to work remotely is going to do a lot of good in this circumstance. Yeah, and the, the COVID mystery um, continues to unfurl before our eyes. And that which we thought was dangerous three months ago may not be as dangerous as we thought, but we do know that there are very serious dangers presenting and as sort of an example, the ultimate example of an accommodation, um, I read an article today about a lawyer in Florida, um, which is now subject to a very serious um, ramping up of COVID. Um, the lawyer had a sentencing hearing, the courts 
are open there or some of the courts are open there. And he showed up to court in full hazmat gear. Um, so he was wearing the white suit with the mask and everything. And he explained his concerns to the judge. The judge let him appear at the sentencing hearing in hazmat gear. Um, anybody who's got a real concern that's medical, get your medical documentation lined up. And if your doctor says um, you can't be working because of any kind of COVID related concern, that's your position, um, particularly when work from home, as Simran said, is feasible. And if the employer gives you a hard time about this, and let's face it, some employers um, are just difficult about this sort of thing because they have a bias against working from home. Um, if your employer gives you a hard time, get legal advice. For sure. Um, we actually have a very interesting state-related question. Um, it is, what are the legal rights of adopted children when a parent, biological or adoptive, passes away? If the will makes a gift to my children, does that include adoptive children? All right. So um, before I answer this question, I, I have to apologize because I, I'm going to do the typical slimy politician thing and pivot from answering the question to pivoting to answering the question that I want to answer. Um, but in my defense, um, there is a fairly straightforward answer to this one, but it opens up the doorway to, I think, a really critical area that I want to address. Um, so the, um, the Succession Law Reform Act in Ontario um, does not define children as biological. Uh, therefore, in theory, um, if you name somebody as a child or you name children in your last will, um, they, the will would make no distinction as between um, your natural children and um, the adopted children. Um, and, you know, as far as the, the flip side, if you are an adopted child and you were dependent on a parent for financial support and that parent left you out of his or her last will um, and you were now cut off from your source of income that would have been that parent's estate again you oh Paul, i think we just lost you for the last two seconds oh yeah i think i was getting an echo on my line can people hear me a little bit better now yeah i think we can hear a you a little bit okay mm -hmm. Um, the adopted child would, in that case, have, in theory, uh, the same rights as the natural, uh, the naturally born child. But the much more interesting question that I want to address here is why this question um, should be uh, for you to. Oh, Paul, we're losing you again. What is the next question? And we can come back to Paul on this one later on. Yeah, sure. Then, well, I was actually hoping to get back to the question that I skimmed over, uh, which was, let me just find it over here. I was let go from my job with no reason as to why. A week later, I found out that they hired someone else to replace me. Should I sign their enhanced severance package? Um, and I think I want to reiterate what, what Gary said is do not sign anything without a lawyer first. Um, the, there, it brings up a couple of different questions. Now, generally speaking, the reasons for a termination are not going to necessarily matter all that much if your termination is without cause. So long as the reasons are not discriminatory or don't amount to harassment or bullying um, or, or an issue like that. If it's you're not getting along with your manager or, you know, they don't love um, your, you haven't been able to meet targets this session, that, reasons like that can still, you know, as long as it's a without cause termination, reasons like that, an employer has discretion to make the, that call. But if the reason is, you know, you're coming back from a parental leave and your employer is concerned you're going to need some time off to care for your young child, you know, that's where it gets murky. That's that's discriminatory and maybe that's not appropriate. 
So step one is really kind of getting to the bottom of why did this termination happen? Is it a reason that we need to really delve into a little bit more? Or is it really just a purely business related reason that has nothing to do with potentially discrimination or harassment? But when it comes down to, let's assume it's a purely employment law related question, no discrimination. Even then, you're going to want to assess whether the offer that they've made you is appropriate in the circumstances. When we talk about a severance package, we're really talking about has your employer given you enough notice of the fact that you're going to be terminated? And they can either do this in one of two ways. They can either say, you know, in three weeks, we're going to end your employment, sorry. Or they can say, we're going to end your employment right away. Here's three weeks, you know, worth of pay instead of the notice that we should have given you. And when I talk about, you know, is that adequate notice, the question really is, is three weeks enough? And that's going to depend on, on, on primarily what are the terms of your employment that you've agreed to. If you've signed an employment contract, typically that employment contract will include some kind of a termination provision. And that purpose, the purpose of that provision is to basically say, if we ever terminate you and it's without cause, we, the employer, are only going to give you the very minimum that we're required to give you under the Employment Standards Act. Now, I should back up a little bit because this is where it gets to be a little complicated. In Ontario, we've got two, a kind of a two-tiered system when it comes to employment law. We've got the Employment Standards Act that sets out the very minimum entitlements that every employee in the province has. And you can't contract out of that. It's it, every employer needs to provide you with those minimum standards. And that includes termination notice as well and severance notice. But if your employer doesn't specifically say, I'm only going to pay you the very minimum, that's when the courts become involved and they can assess what they think is reasonable in the circumstances. And that's something we call common law notice. And the courts tend to be far more generous than what the ESA provides for so those minimum standards. You know, you could be looking at anywhere from two to four weeks of notice per year of your employment um, if there isn't a termination clause that limits you to just the Employment Standards Act. So I guess the short answer to this, to this question is speak with the lawyer because the proposal that you're seeing in this letter may not necessarily be adequate. And if there are some real questions about why this termination happened, you could potentially have additional damages as well. Yeah, you know, Simran, one of the patterns that I've been seeing over recent weeks um, is employer misrepresentation at the time of termination. Mm -hmm. So the employer says, I'm really sorry, our business is in trouble, we have to downsize, um, and we have no choice but to let you go. Um, and the employee who's loyal and been around for a while feels sorry for the employer and agrees to be lowballed on a severance um, offer, and then a week later, um, the employer is advertising for exactly that job. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder whether some of these kinds of COVID-related misrepresentations are going to be actionable. Um, and, you know, if you've signed um, a release on the understanding that it's simply necessary for the termination to occur because there's no money, there's no work, there's no future. We're doing you a favor by letting you go so you can get your career started elsewhere. And it turns out that that's all BS. I, I, I'm wondering whether that's gonna be actionable. Um, and employers, you know, just like some employees are gonna to try to leverage CERB to stay off of work longer than they should, um, some employers, are going to try to leverage um, COVID to get rid of people they just want to get rid of. Um, and some of those terminations um, will not pass the smell test. And whether they amount to bad faith, whether there's an opportunity for moral damages, which are not related to how long you've been there, but just related to how badly the employer has acted, um, the, the, the question is open for me. And uh, again, we'll have more answers um, six months from now after some of those kinds of cases start filtering their way through the system. 
So I think what would be interesting is I know the courts have affirmed that there is this duty of fair dealing on both ends. And so I'm interested in seeing if, if they actually, if that plays into what the courts are going to do. Because if you've got an employer that's being very dishonest about the reasons for a termination, I mean, that certainly seems to breach the duty of fair dealing and whether or not that's going to lead to some additional damages is, is I don't know if the courts are going to make that leap just yet, but it, it would be really interesting to see. So we, um, it's 8.40 p.m. and almost all of you have been here for the whole program. I really want to thank you for that. Um, it's, it's really great um, that you have been able to join us. Um, we're going to try and do these regularly, and we invite you to join us again. Um, maybe we'll wrap up with one or two questions that are left, Simran, and sure. then we'll yeah. leave it until the next time, hopefully with everybody still wanting more. Well, um, we've got um, a question for you, Paul, and it yeah. was, I was wondering whether um, about rights one would have to any shared investments with family members. Rather, if a family member put money into an investment in your name and you co-sign on any changes to the investment, do, you, do they have the right to withdraw the funds or, or if it is in your name, does it remain yours? What would happen if they did so without consent and what rights would you have and on what grounds would they have to do so without consent? So again, a really fascinating um, question to which the actual legal answer is maybe not as important as the philosophical issue that it, it leads into. Um, in, in certain situations, a family member can um, put an, a shared investment in the name of another family member, and um, sometimes it will, the, the courts will treat it as something that was intended all along to be the exclusive property of the person for whom uh, that benefit or fund was actually intended uh, to be, uh, for whom it was actually intended. And sometimes the courts will um, make a finding that um, the person who is um, the joint owners of the fund um, don't automatically have the same rights to use it. Um, and this sort of goes into the, the question or the point that I was trying to make about um, uh, including adopted children in your last will. So, so, so much of the answer that a judge will uh, apply to your case depends not on what the law says, uh, but what the parties intended to do at the time that they made these arrangements whether it's you know a parent uh, putting a child as a co-owner of an investment fund or a parent um, uh, making a last will that divided their property equally between all their children including you know some who were their natural born children some who were their adopted children or um, even situations in which um, there were children in a blended family from two marriages um, my biggest pitch to why, when it's possible, you should always get legal advice from a lawyer when entering into these kinds of agreements or when preparing these agreements for your family is that a lawyer can document um, what you actually intended to do. Um, because, you know, the law may say one thing about um, what happens when you put money in a co-owned investment, but you and your family may have had something very different in mind. And having a lawyer um, help you document what you intended to do when you did these things can really, really save you and your family and the financial plans that you uh, made for yourselves um, from uh, being attacked collaterally down the line by people who feel uh, that they are done by, by any financial decision that you made. Um, and it, you know, sometimes there are also positive tax implications there as well. But the point I, I want to make is that, um, you know, you, you really want to have somebody who can give impartial evidence about what, um, whether it was intended that the person be allowed to withdraw funds without your consent or not, um, or, you know, whether it was your intention that you benefit 
um, your, your naturally born children and your adopted children equally under your last will. Because oftentimes the determining factor in court really is what the parties intended and not um, what the law says. Um, I, and I agree. I think that the short answer on, on this question is it sounds like it's going to be very fact specific, both in terms of the history of dealings, the fact that you've been involved um, by necessity in certain other transactions, um, what paperwork there is with regard to the original investment and any other transactions. So I, I, I think that speak to a lawyer to find out whether you have a continuing interest in this asset that can be asserted. And just one other thing that I, I want to say, it, it sort of goes to the previous question about adopted children, but um, you know, it's a general comment about uh, forms that you can download online and make yourself. And I think, um, you know, online will kits are a particularly nefarious example of this. Like I've, I want to believe that will kits uh, work. I want to believe that they're effective, but in my admittedly somewhat short legal career, I've been at it for about five years. I've never seen one completed that didn't have a mistake in it somewhere. And sometimes the mistakes can be innocent, but sometimes they can really radically affect what the document means. And sometimes you, what you really intended to do when you made this document is do something like uh, benefit all of your children equally or make it explicit that um, you have the right to withdraw funds without the consent of the other co-owner of the account, but you get a pre-formatted document and, you know, the, the, the coding language is glitchy or the document was, um, you know, designed with another legal jurisdiction in mind where the rules are different and you can wind up getting a result that is completely the opposite of what you intended. Uh, and I caution everybody against... Um, doing this and putting themselves in a situation where they expose themselves and their family to unneeded financial risk and litigation. All right. Do we have any further questions for Simran? Maybe a last question. Yeah, I have one really other good one for Simran. Um, I, you know, I, I think that this is, I think this really sums up a lot about what we say about what you should get out of a, a consult with a lawyer and, why it's so great to uh, build a relationship with a lawyer um, early, on in, early on in your life and your professional career. Um, somebody asked us, uh, what sort of things should I look for in an employment contract? I mean, before I sign anything. Great question again. Um, if I could sum up the three- Which parts on the- Oh. Uh, Just carry on. Uh, should I really pay attention to? Well, I think I guessed the rest of that question there. Um, when it comes to employment contracts, it's a good idea if you can to get some legal advice, just because at the end of the day, essentially what you're doing is you're saying, I will contract my services in return for, um, for compensation and we're mutually agreeing that this will be on the basis of these terms. So unless you are very comfortable with understanding what those terms are, these contracts do tend to include a lot of legalese and it's a good idea to get a lawyer involved to just break it down in plain English in terms of what it is you're agreeing to. But if I could just break it down and I'd say the three most important things to be aware of in an employment contract. Number one is your termination provision. Most employment contracts are going to include some kind of language where the employer will try to limit what they're obliged to pay you in the event of a termination without cause. Um, it's helpful to know if that language is actually going to be enforceable or not. Um, and if you're in a position where you can perhaps even try to negotiate that term, term, term to provide you with a better framework upon termination, you know, that's the time you're going to want to try to leverage that as well. Um, the second provision is probably just even understanding, is there a pro probationary clause included in this contract? And what kind of term are you talking about here? Is it a fixed term contract? Is it indefinite? Um, how long are you going to be considered probationary? Does that align with what the Employment Standards Act provides for as well? So just understanding the very basics of what, of what you're agreeing to with respect to the term. And sometimes it can get a little bit more complicated, you know, if you've previously worked with the employer 
and have had a gap in your employment, is that going to be acknowledged? And you know, is that tenure going to factor in? So if there's a situation like that, you definitely want to get some clarity. And then finally, you really want to look at restrictive covenants. And that's basically terms that restrict you from doing something even after, during the employment term and even after the employment term. So think about clauses like non-solicitation provisions or non-compete provisions. Um, non-compete provisions in the employment law context, not usually enforceable, but again, it really depends on the context. Um, you know, what kind of, what's the language of that provision? Are you selling a business and continuing on? You know, there's going to be certain facts that are going to change that. But generally speaking, the courts don't like employers restricting someone's ability to trade, which is why non-compete provisions are typically not um, considered enforceable as a starting point. Um, but those are the three kind of aspects from an employment agreement that you're definitely going to want to understand what you're agreeing to um, when you sign that dotted line. Yeah, just my, my comment on this um, is employment agreements are prepared by employers and their lawyers. Um, they're prepared with the objective of protecting the employer. And while remaining within the, the law, um, strictly within the, the four corners of the law, the objective of every employment agreement is to protect the employer. Um, that means that it's in your interest as an employee um, to get legal advice, just as any employer who prepares an employment agreement herself or himself without consulting a lawyer is taking very serious risks, and it does occasionally happen, you as an employee should know what you're getting into. And, you know, the, the one scenario that was going through my mind, Simran, as you were speaking, is you've been in a really reasonably happy job for 10 years. Um, you get a new offer um, from an employer who wants to limit you, um, your termination entitlements, to one week per year to a maximum of eight weeks as provided in the Employment Standards Act. Um, in your old job, assuming you don't have an employment agreement, you're gonna be entitled to somewhere in the area of a month per year in the event that you've been terminated, depending on a couple of other factors, but let's for discussion purposes say somewhere in the area of a month per year. Um, in this new job, they could fire you um, on day number three, um, give you nothing because you're still in probation and just say, sorry, it wasn't a good fit. So before jumping in, to that kind of an arrangement, read your employment agreement very closely. And if there's a termination provision that sounds like it's limiting you to, to the statutory minimums under the Employment Standards Act, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get legal advice to confirm that. And then see if um, there's the opportunity to negotiate something better. And many employers, especially in positions that are becoming more senior, many employers have flexibility um, when it comes to those dialogues, but they'll start with their standard contract and then work it from there. So I think we've come to a natural um, conclusion point. Um, I'll let you and uh, Paul sign things off, but just speaking personally, this has been a lot of fun, just like all of our legally adulting um, programs have been. We're used to being um, in ca cafes in front of real people, but this is just as good in some ways. We really appreciate um, everybody's contribution with questions, both before and after, and looking forward to seeing you all again. So thank you and good night, Simran and Paul. Take it away. Well, thank you again for being here. It's been, this is actually really our first seminar online, and it's actually been really nice to be able to interact with you guys, um, both with our presentation and chat function, and it's just been a pleasure being here, and thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, and, and Simran, should we repeat some of the information that people can take back with them uh, if they want to get in touch with us after the program is over to ask us some legal questions? Yeah, that would be great. I mean, anytime you have a question, you're more than welcome to call our office. Uh, you can speak with Joy UC, who will take down some information, or you can uh, get in touch with Paul, myself, or Gary directly. And we're all probably best accessible by email, so you can always drop us a line, um, and uh, we'll definitely get back to you. 
and all the contact information is available at our website, um, wiselaw.net. Um, again, phone number 416-972-1800. Um, press zero to speak to Joy, or you can um, speak to each of us. Our extensions um, are listed um, when, when you call, so you'll be able to get in touch with us at your convenience. Thank you, everybody, and good night until the next time. Join us for Legally Adulting. Adulting is not supposed to be easy. What are the questions and concerns that we as young people have about living through a pandemic?